Hello all. Um, I'm not going to do an intro for this video. I'm just going to jump into it because it's just an addendum to the last video. This video is about why I don't think fissure esterification is happening in any meaningful way when fermenting or distilling spirits. So fissure esterification seems like it might be a simple reaction, you know, carboxylic acid reacting with an alcohol in the presence of a strong acid catalyst, you know, you get ester in water as your products. Uh, this is why it's also technically called a dehydration reaction because you're removing water. The opposite to the fissure esterification is called acid hydrolysis, and it's just turning an ester and water back into a carboxylic acid and an alcohol in the presence of a strong acid catalyst. Sounds easy enough, but there are two principles in chemistry that make the quantity of esters produced via this reaction all but negligible over the time periods we're dealing with in the conditions that we're dealing with them. So those two principles are Le Chatelier's principle and acid catalysis. So the first issue, if you look at the typical esterification reaction, you have your alcohol, carboxylic acid, strong acid, ester, and water. Seems simple enough, but Le Chatelier's principle tells us that if you have an abundance of one of the products, it will cause the reaction to shift more towards the left. So if you have more ester or more water, this reaction will act more like an acid hydrolysis than it will like Fischer esterification. In essentially every case we deal with, fermentation, distilling, and aging, we are dealing with huge amounts of water. So we're going to see negligible quantities of esters being produced via Fischer esterification because the water will be at best acting like an inhibitor and at worst it'll be acting to promote acid hydrolysis. The opposite reaction even though you know even though this opposite reaction would still go very slow in the absence of a strong acid catalyst which leads me to the second issue. The second issue is the catalyst. If you ever do any reading into esterification, you'll see almost every reference to it states something along the lines of in the presence of a strong acid catalyst. And they will reference typically uh, hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. You may see sulfuric acid more often than hydrochloric simply because they refer to ideal situations. So, you know, pure alcohol, pure carboxylic acid, pure strong acid, no water at all in any of them. And sulfuric acid is also a dehydrating agent. So when they would mix these all together, any water produced would be reacted with with that sulfuric acid and it would no longer be a part of the product. So the reaction would still be going significantly left to right instead of right to left as it does in the presence of water. So with this strong acid catalyst, technically speaking, what is doing the actual catalysis, catalyzing, is, the, is what's called a hydronium ion. And it's created by the acid. So you might wonder, why can't the carboxylic acid produce this hydronium ion? You know, it's also an acid. Then we wouldn't need a catalyst at all in the first place. True, it is an acid, and it does produce hydronium ions but the carboxylic acid will be what is termed a weak acid. The key characteristic of a weak acid is, is that it doesn't completely disassociate when added to the solution. So what does this mean? Well, when you add a weak acid, let's just say acetic acid, it disassociates into an a hydrogen ion and a acetate ion. This Hydrogen ion will automatically find the nearest water molecule and join it so you get your hydronium. So you have your hydronium and your weak acid. That said, immediately upon this happening, these two, the hydronium and the acetate, your, which is your conjugate base, they will automatically react with each other all over again. So you have disassociations and, re and neutralization reactions happening all over inside your solution. And at any one time, so if you could pause time, you would find that some specific concentration of that acid, that weak acid, has disassociated and some other concentration of it hasn't disassociated. And any time you you know, restart time and then pause it again, those concentrations will be the same. It may not be the exact same molecules which are disassociated. You know, it's sort of a ship of Theseus thing. There will always be the same concentration of disassociated and non-disassociated weak acid. So this relates to the esterification problem because these hydronium ions are never around long enough to be able to react and help cause this esterification reaction to happen. That said, when you add a strong acid, and the difference between a strong acid and a weak 
acid is that when you put a strong acid in the solution, it also disassociates, but it completely disassociates. So hydrochloric acid completely separates into hydronium and a chloride ion, and it stays separated. So now you have this huge abundance of hydronium ions that can come up here and help with this reaction. That's why a weak acid can't really act as a catalyst for esterification. And I say really, because you know technically it will happen, but it is so rare within the time frames that we are discussing that it's not worth mentioning. Exceptionally small amounts of ester will be created, but I hazard a guess that you would be hard pressed to detect it even with you know, something like a gas chromatograph. Even if you're heating this reaction up for weeks in full reflux, without that catalyst there, you're going to be producing negligible amounts. Um, and just to give you some general ideas, the difference between the rate of action of, with something like a hydrogen chloride and an acetic acid is something like 10 to the power of 12 or something like that. That's a huge difference. That's like a billion times slower. That said, if you're aging for decades, some amount of esters, like if you're aging in wood or or if you've aged in wood for some decades and you've switched to a bottle, some amount of esters might be produced enough that it alters the flavor in some meaningful way. But the opposite can also happen, acid hydrolysis, and you could have esters broken down back into alcohols and carboxylic acids. Another thing that's possible, at least with aging on wood, is base hydrolysis because charred hardwoods do contain potassium hydroxide. Anyone who's ever tried to make soap from scratch should know this. Another process that can be happening in aging specifically would be transesterification. This is where you have an ester and an alcohol and the alcohol swaps out for the former alcohol that created the ester. So say you have say you have ethyl acetate and it's sitting around with some butanol. Well that butanol can swap with the ethyl group and you now have butyl acetate and ethanol. But again, this requires a strong acid to be present in order for this reaction to happen. So it's going to take some very long-term aging in order for it to happen without that catalyst. But that's it for this video on Fisher esterification and why I think it's not happening. Make sure to check out Patreon or PayPal donation link if you want to help out the channel. No pressure though. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to learn more and have a great week.